Hi, I'm Dr. Ron England. I'm coming to you from Daytona State College. And actually, today's talk is part of the uh, simulation series, um, but we're going to talk about Newton's Cradle today. And you should see seen a little video of Newton's Cradle there. But let's look at some of the physics that's associated with this. Because, and the reason we're doing this is because in the simulation world, the physics engine, that's that engine that um, is a piece of software that simulates what actually happens in the real world. So let's look at some of the complexities of actually what happens in the real world and then we can kind of understand what's involved with simulating it because realizing that when you simulate real world things you're actually just using mathematics to simulate what goes on in the real world. And a physics engine uses the laws of physics to do that. So in Newton's Cradle we've got a couple of laws of physics that are pretty straightforward that you hopefully have kind of looked at Newton's Cradle and said hey this must be some of the laws of physics that are used here. Uh, first one being conservation of momentum. Okay, that's that mass 1 times velocity 1 equals mass 2 times velocity 2. Realizing that in the real world, velocity is a vector, and actually in simulation, oftentimes velocity is a vector. A lot of times in simulation, you can simplify velocity by making it a scalar, but it is a vector there. And conservation of energy, that good old 1 half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy. That's when those balls are moving really fast and about to hit another ball. They've got a velocity and a mass, and energy needs to be conserved. So, how does this all work together? Well, if you look at your standard physics books, you'll, you'll note that um, most physics books that do talk about Newton's Cradle talk about that conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy. <clears throat> Just to get a good understanding of how this all works, let's go with a hypothetical scenario here. Suppose you pick up two balls, let them go, and they hit the Newton's Cradle and one ball goes away. And of course, if we're going to conserve momentum and energy, intuitively you should be able to say, well, that ball's obviously got to be going faster than the two balls that we started with. But can you even have this situation occur? Well, let's think. Think about that. Um, if we solve the equation with the momentum, Okay, well that means that the two balls are starting so your mass is equal to 2m and if you solve the momentum equation you know that the velocity 2 is actually is got to be twice the velocity of 1 if you've got two balls striking it and one ball going away. Now if we use the same thing with energy and we conserve, conserve energy between the time the ball starts and the time the ball ends, we're going to solve that and we're going to end up with the velocity 2 is equal to the square root of 2 times velocity 1. Well, this doesn't work out too well because for this to work, 2 has to be equal to the square root of 2. And that just simply isn't true. So what this proves is that it isn't actually practical to have two balls hit, come to rest, and one ball go away. So that is not a feasible solution. Now, a lot of the physics books actually say that what occurs with the Newton's Cradle with two balls striking and two balls going away happens because of the conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Well, that's not actually quite true. All we've shown here is that two balls entering and one ball going away with two balls coming to rest is not a feasible solution. It doesn't mean that there's other solutions that, are, that have maybe you know, multiple balls going away or a recoil action aren't feasible. Those could actually occur and we can mathematically actually show some of those occur. So. What it does show, though, is that you can't have two balls heading, coming to rest, and one ball leaving away at twice the velocity or something like that because it doesn't solve both conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And that's actually kind of an important point there. So, we've just shown that it wasn't feasible. Well. I really haven't started delving into the physics that we would need to simulate this. We're not going to write a simulation. I'm going to show you some simulations, but we're not going to write one here. But we need more physics than just conservation of momentum and conservation of energy if we're going to go ahead and come up with a good physics simulation of Newton's Cradle. So let's look at some of the things that actually occur here. You got this ball. Okay, let's look at just one ball. Okay, or maybe two balls. It doesn't really matter. It comes, it strikes the Newton's Cradle, and they come to rest. Well, what does that tell us? Well, if you've got a ball moving at velocity v and it comes to rest, we know that we had to have had some sort of force exerted on it. And if you think about what that force has to be, well, it was moving and now it's not moving. Okay, pretty basic stuff. 
F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. So we know that there was an acceleration that occurred there. Okay, another physical principle that we can apply here. Let's go a little bit further, further there, and let's look at some of the other equations that might be here. Well, one is, if we solve the acceleration, we know that it started with a velocity that was an initial velocity as it struck the other balls and it came to rest. We actually know that that acceleration then is equal to the velocity just before it struck over delta t, the change in time that occurred there. And that's assuming that you had a constant acceleration that brought it to rest, which isn't necessarily a good assumption, but it's going to be good enough for what we're doing now, which means that that force then is equal to the mass times the velocity over delta t. Well, we've got another equation here that we can use called the in impulse equation. Okay, the impulse equation is the integral of f dt from time 1 to time 2. And that's an impulse. And you see impulse occur all the time. Impulse is a great example of impulse is the good old golf swing, hitting that golf ball. Okay, well, if you solve this using the fact that the force is dp over dt where p, p is momentum, then you know that the impulse is simply the change in momentum. Well, that's great. We actually showed another use of a physical principle here, and impulse equations are used in simulations all the time when you want to show perfectly inelastic uh, collisions. Well, that brings up another physical principle that we have here, the concept of elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. I'm not going to cover those in this simple video, but that is something that, um, if you're working this as a physics experiment, that you will want to cover to understand the concept between the elastic and inelastic uh, collisions. Well, let's look at something else here. We've got other physical principles that are uh, that can be applied to this. And one is the thing is that let's look at that ball and say, you know what? We know that the ball, F equals MA, was brought to rest. Well, Newton tells us, hey, you got a force going one direction. Okay, you got to have an equal and opposite force. There's other forces occurring here. Okay, well, what force is occurring here? Well, let's pretend in this case that the ball is a perfect good spring. It may not be a perfectly perfect spring in that it does, might not apply F equals KX exactly, but the concept of force is equal to K, which is uh, a constant times the deformation of the ball, is going to be a pretty good approximation. That's Hooke's law. Okay, we're going to apply Hooke's law in this case, and you can see that you've got this nice little ball that's being deformed here. Well, if it's, a, if it's acting as a spring, then it can actually follow some of the energy equations that go with the spring, such as the potential energy of a spring, which is one-half times kx squared. Well, going backwards and forwards, when you're dealing with that good old mass times acceleration, and you know that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity, and that change in velocity has to occur over time, it also occurs over displacement. So now you've got another equation that you can use to help figure out the physics of what's actually occurring there. And you've got another equation that deals with it too, because x is an, a variable in the potential energy n in Hooke's law. Wow, this is all of a sudden getting complex. But it's getting complex kind of in a good way in that we've got equations that can be solved simultaneously to give us an approximation of what actually occurs in the Newton's cradle. Okay, and there's a lot of physics that's at play here. So going a little bit further here, let's just look at energy, that concept of the energy. I just gave you a potential energy equation for those balls if they act as, act, act as a spring. So now a ball comes in with a kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, strikes the other balls, all the balls tend to deform, and guess what? We've got, while that deformation is going on and is occurring, we've got a potential energy that's being stored in those balls as part of Hooke's law, as far as the uh, actual deformation of a spring. And eventually what happens is you've got a kinetic energy of a ball or multiple balls going off in another direction. And now we can actually look at this from an energy analysis and say, well, what about losses to these energies that we see here? Such as when those balls strike each other, they make a clacking noise. Clack, 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 clack. Well, if they're making a clacking noise, guess what? That sound. Sound has to be ha have some energy to make it occur, and that would have to be a loss from the energies that you see in these equations. You also would have friction. Okay, the whole thing is attached to a spring, a string, so there's a string associated with it, and there's air friction. So there are energy losses, and that is what eventually will bring the entire system to rest. All right. One other thing that I 
really should make sure that you look at um, if you're going to be dealing with the physics of Newton's cradle. And again, remember, I'm not going to solve this for you. I'm just going to show you some of the equations that are involved here. Okay, the good old pendulum equation, and I'm really dealing with the pendulum equation for small amplitudes here because most of the time with the Newton's cradle, that theta, that, that, that ang amplitude angle, never really gets that big. Now, of course, you could really have fun and throw those balls at it um, by bringing it back with a big swing, trying to make it go in a full circle, but you know what? That's not what we're doing here. And the pendulum equation for small amplitude is that 2 pi times the square root of L over G, G being the uh, gravitational constant, but L being the length, that's that distance from the frictionless pivot to that good old ball, that thing that's going back and forth. So knowing that, and that's a good physical principle to look at here, is that really the period of a pendulum, and you can compare the behavior of a Newton's cradle to the behavior of a pendulum and see how that actually goes, because that tells you how much of that impulse equation, because if the impulse is actually a zero time impulse, which is really impossible in reality, but as a zero uh, impulse, guess what? It's going to behave just like a pendulum. Wow, we've got a whole lot here, okay? And really what I'm trying to do is trying to get you started, okay? So let's look at some ideas of things that we can do in a, in a classroom. Well, the first one is you can build a Newton's cradle, okay? You need some balls, you need some string, okay? You need something that you can hook the whole thing to. Okay, we can also look at different physics engines and we can simulate this. Okay, what is that going to look like? I've got some beautiful animations here from different websites where boom, clack, 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 and I can do it with different combinations of balls. Okay, that's a really neat simulation that's, that's involved right there. Okay, well, guess what? I can do some very much more complex ones here. Say, for example, I'm going to go ahead and reset this one and I'll start it going with you know, a few balls here and actually show you different things and this one's using my physics lab okay I can do this with you know, one give it a lot of stretch there get the whole thing going and notice it has a behavior because I've now made a fairly complex system because I've moved the balls multiple times that is behaving a lot like what you would see in reality now is it behaving exactly like you'd see in reality well in this case not really uh, let's do one thing here we could change you know, and this is a fun one. If you're using the MyPhysics Lab version of this, one of my favorites is to change elasticity to something like 1.1. Well, that's impossible. But you know what would happen if you did that? Well, notice every time I swing the thing, the ball gets higher. Okay, I'm creating energy. Okay, it's eventually going to blow up here, and boom, now the ball's going all the way around in a circle, and this is just going to get faster and faster, and I should probably stop it before it destroys itself. But you can have a lot of fun with that. What else can you do with this? Different size balls, okay? If you're building your own Newton's cradle, now you've got that possibility of building it with different size of balls. And really, looking at the simulation, the equations, what you can do by hand, and doing a correlation between what you actually see in real life and what you can do in simulation. You can spend weeks learning wonderful, simple mechanical physics just using Newton's cradle. So this is a great thing to do and try, and I hope that I've really kind of launched you off into some awesome physics ideas of things that you can do. My objective was never to solve all these, but was to get you started and what you need to do to look at the physics associated with this with some simple physical explanations of what's going on. Have a good time out there. Hope you enjoyed this wonderful little short on Newton's Cradle.